I'll probably describe myself as Czech British because I live in Czech and I'll have lived there for most of my life. But enough ranting. Let's move on. Yes, Mr. Frodo. It's over now. Today's video is brought to you by our friends over at Squarespace. More about them in a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. In this one, uh... <laughs> Can't see it. There we go. Things Americans find totally normal, but others find bizarre. Oh my god. Didn't I just make this video? A few moments later. I'm like, I just made this video because I remember making a distasteful joke about how Americans find school shootings normal. The rest of the world finds it completely different. I'm like, what's going on? Because, but I also see the first line and I'm like, it wasn't about that. What are you talking about? And then I realize I've made an error. Well, not really an error. This will just be part two because uh, I think we must have had uh, a video that was what British people find weird. And uh, this is written by Kevin. Danny wrote a script on this same subject. So some might say this is uh, Danny and Kevin going head to head. Um, except, I mean, Kevin's got an inbuilt advantage because he's actually an American. Let's see if there's any crossover. <laughs> I could, of course, scrap one of these. But I'm not going to do that because I already paid for them. So uh, that's how my... Well, let's just say my sweet capitalist... Uh, cap, uh, uh, my sweet capitalist heart beats strongly, doesn't it? Let's go. Modern day mummies. I was probably 15 years old when I went to my first funeral, which is unsurprisingly an unpleasant experience. The entire ordeal was made in measure... I already know what Kevin's talking about. What the... Uh, I, <laughs> I'm going to a funeral next week. My uh, granddad, he was very old. Um, so, you know, it was time. It was, it was like in his mid-90s. Strong, good life. And then... <laughs> cheery subject, Simon. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You know what we don't do in the UK? I don't see my dead grandfather's face at his funeral. Because the funeral thing is closed. Not because he died in a car accident and it's all, like, ruined. Which I think is what happens in America. If it's, like, if the body's too ruined, you don't have it open. But I guess we're about to find out. But most of the time, it's open, right? And you see a movie, someone will go up and give the dead body a kiss. And I'm like, Ah, oh, America, where did you get this from? We're quite culturally similar in a lot of ways, but this is so strange. <laughs> Don't be looking at the dead. I've never seen a dead body and I'm happy about it. It's fucking weird. His face hurts. He can't see without his glasses. Put his glasses on. The fuck? The entire ordeal was made immeasurably worse by the fact that the coffin lid... God, it'd be funny if it wasn't actually what Kevin was going to talk about, wouldn't it? It'd be uncomfortable. The entire ordeal was made immeasurably worse by the fact that the coffin lid was wide open, showing off my deceased grandfather to the world, and everyone was expected to go kneel in front of the open casket and pay their last respects. It was a horribly uncomfortable situation. I was absolutely not f***ing up for it. As <laughs> deeply... <laughs> Why?! <laughs> Is it like, well, we just want to make sure that they're, uh, they're dead? That they're actually in there? That someone hasn't stolen the body? What the fuck? Why? Bring a little stupid ass on. As deeply disturbing as I found the whole thing, I can only imagine how it would have been for my four-year-old sister. While rare in many parts of the world, open casket funerals aren't unheard of outside of the United States. Even more common is a brief wake or viewing period before the actual funeral takes place. A viewing period? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but there is something <laughs> I just want to go and look at a dead body of someone that you loved. It's weird America. It's weird. I'm sorry. It's weird and that the corpse is pump and that the and that is pumping the corpse. But there is something that is almost exclusive to America, and that is pumping the corpse's veins full of delicious embalming fluid. This process is almost unheard of outside of the United States and Canada, although it does appear to be becoming more popular in New Zealand and at least in parts of the UK. Not only is embalming of bodies exceedingly rare elsewhere in the world, in many cultures it is discouraged or even illegal. I have to say, I kind of thought that embalming... I mean, is that to, so your your body doesn't rot as quickly? Which is a bit weird, because I mean, you're dead. Why are we trying to keep your body all fresh? Especially if it's like, if you're not in America and you've got the open casket. It's like, what does it matter if it gets a little, you know, a little bit non-fresh? No one can smell it. I assume those caskets are sealed. 
It's a bit weird, isn't it? Maybe as Americans we just love our family and friends more than the rest of the world does, or maybe we're just stupid enough to spend a thousand dollars making a dead body look slightly more lifelike for a couple of hours that someone's going to see it. But hey, if your loved one really wants to pay the money to be embalmed so they can open a get funeral, well, that's what their insurance is for, right? Just remember that the insurance payout isn't going to come for months, and you have to pay for funeral costs up front and in full, so you better get saving. Yeah, um, uh, funerals are surprisingly expensive, right? Which is like, okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Hyphenated Americans. First of all, I keep referring to people from the United States as Americans because that's what people do here. Yeah, I don't know if mine was from Brazil. <laughs> and he was like, he'd always introduced himself as like, no, I'm from America. And then people would be like, oh, okay, like whereabouts? Brazil. <laughs> Because he was always like, America is in the United States. It's a continent, okay? And he was just making a point. Bit of a dick, really. <laughs> no, he's a nice guy, but it's kind of like a dick move. That's also another thing the rest of the world thinks is weird, because America makes up two continents with just over a billion people, and the United States is only about a third of that population. As strange as this may seem to people from other countries, it's easy to understand. The United States isn't... Oh, a billion. Sorry, for some reason I got my head too, Billy. As strange as this may seem to people from other countries, it's easy to understand. We call ourselves American because those other 700 million people aren't terribly important. After all, this is the country where children are repeatedly taught in school that the United States is the greatest country in the world. I'm sorry, my fellow Americans, but that is some factually inaccurate xenophobic bullshit. I don't know. Like, in many ways, America is. America's the richest country in the world? Is that true? I feel like that's true. I get definitely got the they're probably China's up there, but America's still the most powerful country in the world, right? Culturally it's the most powerful country in the world, I would say. You know, Hollywood and stuff, very powerful. But I also yeah, I don't know. I feel some people push back against this. Like I feel like Kevin is pushing back against America being so great because it's been thrust down his throat his whole life how great America is, whereas I'm like, I don't know, I feel a bit more objective. I'm like, I make fun of America, but generally doing pretty good. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, there's uh, like every country does sh a bit of shit, but I don't know. I'm like America, good job. <laughs> you are American? Yes. Oh, you must have very big penis. Excuse me. This is the United States of America, for God's sake. Besides, what's the point in saying how great it is to be an American when most people don't even think of themselves as American? Growing up, an extremely common question people would ask one another was, what nationality are you? It was seen as just a normal part of getting to know someone, and no one's answer was ever American. Wait, isn't it? If I met someone and I was like, where are you from? They'd be like, I'm American. I'm from America. Do people just not do that in a... Because I guess I'm not asking this in America, because most of the time it's like, I'm American, aren't I? Um, but abroad, people would say they're from America or the US. The US of A. People were Italian, Irish, Estonian, Armenian, Chinese, or whatever else. Oh, I get what you're getting at. And this is weird. We do find this weird. Because someone will be like, no, no, I'm Irish. And it's like, but you live in New York. You were born in Ireland, and so you're... You, and then you moved to America. How long have you been? You look, sound very American. Actually, I'm Irish. You're not fucking Irish, mate. That's not what Irish is. It's just not. I did that My Heritage thing. Like... If that's the way, I'm not British. Because my dad's not from Britain. My mum's family, that side of the family, it was like 1850s, they moved over from Weimar, Germany. I'm from neither. I'm British. And at some point, like in 50 years or whatever, I'll probably describe myself as Czech British because I live in Czech and I'll have lived there for most of my life. But enough ranting, let's move on. Yes, Mr. Frodo. It's over now. But no one ever answers with their actual nationality, which is American. Another thing they teach in school here is that the United States is supposed to be a melting pot of different cultures, but apparently we're more like a bottle of vinaigrette that the founding fathers forgot to shake properly. I understand there are exceptions to this, of course. My grandmother was a first-generation immigrant who could speak Italian and non-ironically referred to the Mafia as the protectors of the people. <laughs> Holy shit, Kevin's grandma. If she wanted to say she was Italian, that's fine because she's Italian. But generations later, there's no real reason for me to identify as such. Likewise, there was probably no reason for my grandfather, who was born in Massachusetts and fought the Nazis in World War II, to identify as German. The fact that my German ancestors came to America on the Mayflower and survived the murderous rampage of the great-great-etc. grandfather of one of Simon's other writers is a neat bit of family history and all, but I think I don't think anyone in my family has been to Germany in the last 300 years other than to kill Nazis. It doesn't 
make a lot of sense that I should be expected to incorporate that nationality into my identity. <laughs> it's so true. Learning about your ancestors could, of course, be fascinating. It is. I, I have a great time on my heritage. Does it make me from Germany? No. No. Hence the popularity of all those DNA ancestry services, but the extent to which Americans identify themselves based on their ancestral heritage rather than their actual nationality is virtually unheard of around the world. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> my ancestry is like, boom, half British, boom, half like Eastern European, and that's how it is. Easy. But it's like, do I identify as Eastern Europe? Like, it's like Lithuania area. Do I identify as being from- no. No, I'm British. <laughs> That's where I was born. What are you talking about? Many countries all around the world don't even collect data on race or ethnic backgrounds of its citizens because they simply don't care. If you live, <laughs> wait, America collects this information? <laughs> what? <laughs> so bizarre. If you live in France, you're French. That's the end of it. The problem appears to be getting exacerbated by the growing popularity of DNA ancestry tests, which ignores the fact that race and ethnicity have absolutely no genetic basis. But that's a topic for another day. Now, I'm going to interrupt this video, tell you about our friends over at Squarespace. Look, 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 you've heard me talk about Squarespace before. I don't think there is a sponsor on this channel that has been with us as long and as often as Squarespace. And honestly, I love them for it. Obviously, the sponsorships make things, make things like this, make this channel possible, obviously. And you, dear viewer, watching and, of course, setting up your website that you definitely need with Squarespace. Uh, look, it's 2022. And if you, if it even enters your mind, like, oh my god, I could use a website. I could use a website for that thing. I want to sell widgets online. I want to tell people about my bad political takes. I want to start a community news. Whatever, whatever. Do it with Squarespace. There should be no other word that enters your mind in the 21st century, in the year of our Lord 2022, other than Squarespace. Because what you do with Squarespace is you go, I don't need, I don't need these. I don't need these talking points, Squarespace. Watch me just absolutely riff it. We're gonna do fine. All you need to do is you go over to Squarespace and they have this little thing. They're like, okay, you wanna make a website? Punk? They don't say punk, but they're like, you wanna make a website? And you're like, yes, please. There's a quiz. They ask you, what's your website for? What do you wanna do? What sort of star? Blah, blah, blah. And then they're like, thank you for filling out this very short and easy to do quiz. Here are the templates that we think you will like. And you're like, oh my God, I do like them. Does this have something to do with the quiz that I just took? How did you know? And then you choose one, you're like, you click on it, and it's all filled with like placeholder text and images. You swap all of that out. It takes, I would say, five minutes. That would be a lie. You will be done with a website from start to finish in an afternoon. In half an afternoon. You could probably do it on your lunch break if you really wanted, so you can get out of that job that is crushing your soul and follow your dream of selling widgets or giving people your bad takes and getting advertisers. You know, this sort of stuff i don't know look you do you you did start a podcast I don't know, that's what i would do i'll start a podcast or a youtube channel and then make a website that goes along with the youtube channel because why not it's, i know that works <laughs> Um, and then you fill it all out. It's very easy and there's just nothing to worry about. Also, if you want to customize it, then you can do that. There's a bunch of extra features that I'm not going to remember, so let me find those. Yeah, they do all like basic stuff. Analytics, so you know what's going on, on your website. Blogs, they do that. Forms, email newsletters, look, all of this good stuff. It's just they, they have everything you need everything you need. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash blaze to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or a domain. Thank you, Squarespace. Thank you. And we'll get back to today's video. Wanted, dead or alive. The bail system in America. Oh, we have some crossover. We talked about the bail system in the Danny script. Let's, this is true head-to-head -head material. I mean, at least uh, they both agree that this is f***ed up. Either that or this was just one of the top results on Google when they Googled... <laughs> this script. Let's go. The bail system in America is pretty different to most of the world, with only about a dozen countries actually using one in any form, but that's too politically charged. So instead, let's talk about the offshoot industry of bounty hunters. Oh, okay, so we're splitting up, talking about something a little bit different. Rather than bail, we'll talk about bounty hunters. Who's that famous guy? Dog. He, he, I always get him confused with Hulk Hogan. Do they look similar or is that just in my mind? Dog the bounty hunter. He's like out hunt, hunting bounties. 
My sister used to love that show. She'd always be watching Dogs Bounty Hunters. I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> okay. Uh, the only other country in the world where bounty hunters are legally permitted is the United States and the Philippines, where commercial bail bonds still exist for anyone unfamiliar. The system works like this. Someone gets arrested and the judge sets bail at $10,000 or whatever amount. The alleged criminal can't afford that, so they pay 10% to a bail bondsman who covers the whole bill. When the defendant shows up for trial, the full bail is returned to the bondsman who has now made $1,000 on a very short-term loan. Seems like a pretty sweet deal from them until a defendant decides not to show up. When that happens, it's time to call in the bounty hunters. Theoretically, they're now supposed to be referred to as either bail enforcement agents or fugitive recovery agents, but bounty hunter sounds pretty badass, so people have largely stuck with it. Yeah, if your job has an awesome name, and then someone was like, oh, it's not really PC anymore, I'll be like, are you going to pay for me to reprint my business cards? Because they're going to say bounty hunter until, well, until then just forever. <laughs> Because it's too cool. You don't hate me because I'm beautiful. The goal of a bounty hunter is to collect the runaway fugitive and drag their ass to court so that the bondsman can get his money back. With a bounty hunter usually getting to keep 10% of what would have been the bondsman's entire profits. Probably the weirdest part of the whole system is that in some ways the legal authority of a bounty hunter actually exceeds that of the police officers. This is particularly interesting since bounty hunters are normally required to receive little to no training. While there are lots of recommended resources and classes they could take if they chose to, in California, for for example, it only takes 60 hours of required training to become a bounty hunter. After that, anyone can receive a license that gives them some pretty impressive legal power. Not only can they legally arrest people, whereas normally trying to handcuff and detain a person would be a crime, but they could chase you across state lines. Nope, nope, stop talking, go to jail. I don't mean chase you in the sense of an active pursuit, as police generally can do that as well, but if they get a tip you went to the next state, they can still track you down without needing to involve other authorities. Oh, okay. So if, like, California police find out that their criminals, like, gone over to, um... State next to California? Nevada? Possibly? If they go over to Nevada, they have to phone the Nevada police. But I guess if they're chasing you on the highway, that could continue. Can you imagine you get to that line and they're like, they're, the police have to just stop and they can't chase you anymore. <laughs> You're like, so long, suckers! Or if they're able to see you at home through your window, they could just kick your door down. No warrant required. Really? That's really intense. Because the police <laughs> they'll be like, you can't just do that. Bouncy hunters have a success rate of over 90%. No way. With some reports putting it as high as 99. With others like that, you may think that more countries would employ them. Why would having bounty hunters seem strange to people from other countries oh, when they're so effective at upending runaway fugitives? Well, because I think as we discussed in the Danny video, other countries don't have bond. <laughs> it's like, no, you just wait in prison for your turn. It turns out other countries have developed a different resource for tracking down criminals on the lam. They call it the police. <laughs> Bounty hunters. We don't need their scum. My brother's a bounty hunter, Gareth. Shoes. <laughs> Growing up, everyone had that one friend. It was the person whose house you'd go to. But the second you walked in the door, they'd remind you, my mum says we have to take off our shoes. It always seemed like such a pain in the ass, and it never occurred to the rest of us that the entire rest of the world takes off their shoes indoors. Um, okay. I don't know if that's quite true, Kevin, because I never took off my shoes indoors as a kid. Like... My parents will be like, wear your shoes inside, otherwise you're gonna like step on something or hurt your toes and stuff like that. So my parents would have a go at me if my, if, like, they'd be put on some slippers. We can walk around barefoot. And uh, we'd wear shoes inside all the time. And then I moved to check, and their kids get to school and they take off the shoes and they put on school slippers. Like they have a little place where they leave their shoes and they take these slippers and they put them on because that's the culture. Like I'm wearing my shoes inside. This is my office. I'm the only one here. I'm wearing my shoes inside. I don't give a shit. But everywhere else people are taking off their shoes all the time. And it's more comfortable generally like at home. Um, so, but growing up, I didn't take off my shoes inside. But apparently in America, wait, so, no, except you're leaving your shoes on inside, which I'm fine with. That's fine. Like, I don't insist when people come to my house that they take off their shoes because some people don't want to take off their shoes. That's okay. If they drag a shit into my house, I'm going to be like, bruh, bruh, bruh. You could have at least, you know, you... Why? Oh my God! My house is full of shit! 
Obviously not in the supermarket or something, but if you're in someone's home and it's not America, you can be pretty sure that there won't be anyone wearing shoes. Survey numbers are a bit all over the place, but the general consensus seems to be that over 50% of Americans don't take off their shoes in their own home. As someone that lives in a place where snow is common, that is insane to me. I don't want to track snow and mud all over my house. Well, Kevin, we take off our shoes. If you, like, like I say, if you're trodden in a shit or it's really muddy, you take off your shoes. But otherwise, you don't take off your shoes. At least when I was growing up, we didn't. My personal experience. That number may already seem absurdly high to people from around the world, but it gets even weirder. Even though almost half of us take off our shoes in our own houses, people will virtually never take off their shoes in someone else's house unless specifically asked to do so. So even as someone who can't get my own shoes off fast enough at home, I admit that I will absolutely never take off my shoes at someone else's house unless they ask me to do so. And even though I don't wear shoes in my own house, if a guest asks they should take their shoes off, my answer is normally it doesn't doesn't matter to me. I am very sorry and I apologize for the inconvenience of me not giving up. Another, I'm just real, another, I don't know if this is just a Czech thing or more like a international thing or maybe it is even in the UK. No, I don't think it's in the UK. But because I know people do ask people to take their shoes off. We have guest slippers. So like if someone comes to our house, there are slippers that are for guests and they're washed. Like, you know, someone, it, it, this is just how it is. You have guest slippers. And then you go to someone's house, and there are slippers that you can put on in someone else's house. <laughs> Which I always found so strange. But now I'm like, yeah, it's normal. Now I'm used to it. Maybe it's because I'm not very confrontational. I don't want to constantly yell at people, take off your shoes, you f***ing oaf. Or maybe it's because I'm used to wearing my shoes at other people's houses, so it would feel weird for me to suddenly be that guy who makes everyone else take their shoes off. All I can say for sure is that there was some other interesting poll data included in this. I would absolutely never do this, but it seems that the majority of people who wear their shoes covered in mud, snow, and almost certainly do it while they walk through their houses will have no problem eating a piece of food that fell on the carpet. That's pretty gross. Is it though? Are we really gonna get sick from that? I don't know. Also, I'm not gonna eat food that fell on the floor because I don't like germs. Standard household appliances. Okay. There are a lot of useful kitchen appliances that we take for granted. Coffee makers, dishwashers, microwaves, they're all fantastic time savers. Is this gonna be the one about not fridges not being like standard or something? Because that's, that's the one daddy had. Let's see if Kevin gets the same one. But there's one standard kitchen appliance that, much like red solo cups, people outside the US think it might just be some silly TV convention. That appliance is the sink-mounted garbage disposal, or as one European referred to it, those angry sinks that chop shit. I... Uh, where I grew up, we actually had one of these, and it was very unusual to have one of these in the UK. But it's awesome. Like, you just throw, you're, you're like, you know, there's nothing worse. I hate it when you're washing up dishes and then you've got that nasty shit in the sink, you know, that little thing that catches stuff before it goes down the plug. Uh, and you have to fish it out, and it's gross. We we had a sink that this sink that would just grind stuff up when I was a kid, and you just put all sorts of shit in there. While extremely common in almost all of America, it turns out those devices really don't exist anywhere else in the world. In fact, in most of Europe, they're not even legal. Without a garbage disposal, what do you expect to do when you peel vegetables over the sink? You're just supposed to pick up all the discarded bits of cucumber or potato and toss it in a compost pile like some sort of savage. Yes, Kevin. Yes, that's exactly what we do. But we chop it, we peel on a chopping board, and then you scrape all that shit into the bin. <laughs> It turns out there's actually a pretty sensible reason that disposals would be banned in most of Europe. But not in the UK unless my family just got one illegally. <laughs> Americans are known for doing everything bigger, not just our waistbands. So that includes sewage pipes. The pipes in Europe are generally much older than here in the US, and as a result, they're much narrower. But you, Americans, wow, penis so big, so big penis. Well, I, I guess it is a pretty good size. The extra load resulting from garbage disposals can easily result in those pipes becoming clogged or in the worst case scenario actually bursting. Oh, this is such a shame. I guess I'm just discovering this now. I really wanted to put one of these in. I got a house recently and we'd redo in the kitchen. And I was like, can we, I want a garbage disposal. And I guess it's probably illegal. So I definitely won't be doing that. Definitely. <laughs> A garbage disposal is one of those things I won't because I don't want my pipes to clog, to be honest. I was just kind of making it fun. A garbage disposal is one of those things that's hard for me to imagine getting by without, but I'm sure someone who's never had one would wonder what the hell you'd even need it for. Then on the topic of appliances, I was going to include something about air conditioners here, but after the summer, the Northern Hemisphere is had, I had a feeling the rest of the world may soon follow our lead. Fuck it, hell. It's 34 degrees today, which is hot in Fahrenheit. It's really fucking hot. It's like unpleasantly hot. And yeah, I don't have air conditioning at home. I live in a nice place. And it's like, do we have air conditioning? I'm just redoing this house. Is I we putting air conditioning in? No, no one has air conditioning. <laughs> no one. Unless you live 
in the roof that like in a big apartment building if you live in the roof one like right under the roof then it gets unbearably hot so they will have air conditioning but other than that no you just have a fan and you deal with it and then you're fine and that's it i have air conditioning at a, a holiday house i have but because it's like a heat pump so it does hot and cold so i don't know and that's the end of the episode thanks for watching Well, let's just say my sweet capitalist heart, cap, uh, uh, my sweet capitalist heart beats strongly.